Hi everyone, it is an honor to be here with you today. Uh, I was uh, so delighted when Eric invited me to come and speak with this group. Um, it's, it's a privilege, I thank you for it. I very much look forward to meeting you all in person next month when we get together to talk about uh, some of what I'm going to share here in more detail. Just a little bit of background on me before I get into some content here. I don't have a traditional classroom background. I have, uh, I think, 24-ish years at this point uh, experience working with adults, particularly in the areas of leadership development and leading large-scale change initiatives. And after about a decade of that work, working one-on-one -on -one with leaders and with their teams, this theme started to come up for me, which was that so much of what we were helping these adults do was essentially to unlearn what they learned through a standardized system of education. So that brought me back to K through 12. And I was really interested to find out what had changed um, with high school in particular since I had left uh, back in the 80s. And I learned uh, to my horror that not a whole lot had changed since I had graduated high school in the 80s. And that really prompted me to start the nonprofit uh, of which I'm a founder, the Institute for the Future of Learning. And the mission of the nonprofit is to help transform this one size does not fit all model of education. And back in 2018, I believe it was, I published a book called The Human Side of Changing Education. I'd like to share uh, some of the content from that book with you today. And uh, in that book, I mentioned uh, Eric and his great work. His great work, uh, particularly in assessment uh, and some of the resources there included a reference to him in the book and have built a relationship with him over the years. So it's uh, such great company to be in. Uh, I'm honored to be here and I will go ahead now, share a few slides and get into some content. Okay, so uh, let's situate ourselves in, in place and time, uh, if you will. Uh, I love this cartoon by Tom Fishburne. If you haven't checked out any of Tom's work, I encourage you to do so. Uh, Tom's work is a great example of um, your passion never leaves you. So Tom is, uh, calls himself a market tunist. And I remember meeting Mark. It was at a wonderful event called the Do Lectures in Wales. This was back in, gosh, it might have been 2011 or 2012. And he gave a presentation where he shared how, as a kid, uh, he always loved to draw. He was always sketching. He was always um, uh, sketching. Uh, he remembered very vividly as a kid. That's, that's how he spent his time. Uh, but then he was told that uh, you can't make a living drawing and uh, sketching cartoons. So he uh, fast forward, went through the education system, went to Harvard Business School, got an MBA, and found himself uh, in a marketing role and in meetings. And in those meetings, uh, he would be sketching cartoons <laughs> to help pass the time. And then he started to publish uh, the cartoons. They really um, struck a chord with a lot of people. And uh, then that turned into a full-time job and occupation. So I think it's a great example of how your passion never leaves you. It's always there. Here's another uh, little image that popped up in my Facebook feed a couple of months ago, and I think it also helps describe our current reality. I laughed out loud when I saw this one on the screen. Uh, I think we need to let go of this notion of getting back uh, to a normal. There's no normal to get back to. Arguably, the normal that we had in education is not a place that we would want to get back to, even if we could. Uh, Pre-COVID, you might have heard of this phrase, VUCA. It was a term that was first coined by the U.S. Army College after the Cold War. Uh, to describe how the conditions were uh, so volatile, complex, ambiguous, and uncertain that the traditional hierarchical model of leadership was no longer up to the task. The term was then taken by the management literature to describe life in organizations, and it definitely feels like, thanks to COVID, uh, we've had a two-year-plus experience of VICA on steroids. Pre-COVID, uh, there were changes underway in the education system that I want to highlight just a few here uh, before we get back to present day. So uh, what were those changes uh, already underway pre-COVID? You might be familiar with the growing consensus um, around, really around the question of what's worth learning. So uh, Tony Wagner's Global Achievement Gap, you might have read Tony's book, 
where he identified the um, the critical survival skills. In that book, Tony talked about how we don't have an achievement. Well, we do have an achievement gap, but more importantly, uh, we have a relevance gap in education. And then, of course, we have Sir Ken Robinson and his fantastic work. You might be one of the is it 40 million plus people at this point who watched his TED talk on changing education paradigms. Uh, Sir Ken leaves a fantastic legacy of work. Uh, the Hewlett Foundation's Deeper Learning Network, the Partnership for 21st Century School, uh, sorry, for 21st Century Skills, and then my own work uh, on Worthy Skills. And if you read across um, these lists here, you can see that there's much more that binds us than divides us. Uh, you can see the same things over and over, critical thinking, communication, collaboration. There's a great deal of consensus when it comes to uh, the question of what's worth learning. Uh, part of the big challenge, though, when you start to dig under the hood of all of this, if we're saying this is what matters, these are the skills, knowledge and habits of minds, habits of mind that we want our young people to graduate with, uh, this requires significant shifts uh, pedagog pedagogically in our schools. So if we take the left hand column here, industrial schools or factory schools or, you know, two century plus uh, schools and the right hand column post industrial, uh, you might say transformational, you might say industry 4.0, whatever your terminology is, there is a shift from uh, an older way to uh, a newer, more progressive way, if you will. And it's not to say everything on the left hand side here is bad and should be thrown out. Uh, what we're saying is if we're saying things like critical thinking, collaboration, compassion, uh, these kinds of skills uh, are the worthy skills, then we need to make some pretty significant uh, pedagogical shifts where we're moving away from those students of passive, res passive recipients of content uh, to much more self-directed and entrepreneurial learners. I won't go through each of these uh, because um, that's not helpful. <laughs> I'll let you absorb this in your own time. But I do want to pull out um, one in particular, which is the bottom uh, element here on assessment. I think this is one of our biggest levers when it comes to really transforming uh, the system, a shift from content-based assessment by written tests, you know, recall, content recall and learning assessed by the teacher only uh, to really have much more of a movement towards mastery based assessment of skills, uh, knowledge and habits of mind, assessment by self, peers uh, and experts. Uh, and I know that that's uh, very much the area that uh, Eric leans on uh, with with his students. So given the answers and the growing consensus to what's worth learning, given the pedagogical shifts that need to take place, there's an, another element here, and this is the element that I think gets the least discussion when it comes to how do we transform our, our education system. And it's the adult behavioral shifts that need to be supported if we're really serious about this kind of change. So the shifts, again, from the left to the right here, uh, schools for the most part um, are predicated uh, upon mitigating risk, risk exerting control predictability, knowing, having the answer, you know, stay within your departmental lines. When, if we're serious about leading transformative change, that requires a risk orientation. The autonomy needs to be distributed down and across the entire organization. It requires a learning stance as opposed to a knowing stance, asking questions, really having porous departmental lines, working in an interdisciplinary and trans transdisciplinary way. You might find your role is ambiguous uh, as you do this. And again, we mentioned assessment before, and the big question comes up, okay, we need to start. Once we've identified what we value, we need to truly prioritize that and figure out a way to assess it. And then this is where I oftentimes um, experience teachers coming up to me and saying, Julie, uh, I need to push back uh, and, and I'm having difficulty doing that, or I've tried it uh, and it's not and it's not working, it's not helpful. So that's oftentimes uh, where I, I see the rubber really meeting the road here, uh, pushing back when and where it is necessary in support of the vision. So all of this was happening pre-COVID. You might have been experiencing this uh, within your own school, within your own particular learning environment. As we sit here um, day and time, February of 2022, 
there's a, a figure I'd like to show you now. It's from a, a wonderful book called A Little Book of Courage for a Big Pandemic. And it was written by a woman called Sherry Lover. And interestingly, uh, Sherry works a lot with schools in crisis. And this book is, quotes not just for schools, it's for all of us uh, as we experience this pandemic. But this figure that I'm about to share, uh, when I re read it in the book, it really struck me as being a helpful tool to help situate where we are and to navigate our way forward. So as you can see here, we have the onset, the lingering fog, the clear path ahead and the new normal. And I remember it was back in late spring of last year when I first saw this figure. And at that point, the vaccines were starting to be more widely distributed. And there was definitely the sense of being on the cusp, the threshold, if you will, between the lingering fog and the clear path ahead. And I remember feeling that for about four to six weeks. Uh, and then Delta raised its head and it felt like, you know, I just catapulted myself back into the lingering fog at that point. Uh, but what I really take from this figure is with everything that's been happening with COVID um, and in many ways, the, in, the inadequacies of the education system have been led bare. The tremendous pressure uh, that teachers have been under for the past two years to cobble this together, to prop up a two century plus old system with present day technology, with a mental health crisis, uh, with parents stretched beyond thin. I would argue that we don't want to go back to what we had. So the recovery and regaining, uh, while important, I think the job ahead for all of us is, is to reinvent. And my own learning uh, through the pandemic uh, really helped me see that if we really want to build a modern day education system, there are three truths uh, that we need to really recognize and that our leaders need to recognize in order to move forward and to really build back better. So what are those three truths? The first one is it is way past time for systemic equity and dignity and belonging for all students and all children in our, in our schools. Children need to see themselves reflected um, in their teachers, in what they see on the walls, what's in the textbooks, and to see their, themselves, their culture, who they are, reflected, honoured. That applies for students, that applies for all adults. The second truth is the reality of any school um, is that essentially our job is to help prepare our children for an unknowable future. That's a pretty daunting task, and it's very different to the task of uh, how the original system was designed over a century ago. And the third truth is there is so much that we know through the science of learning and development with regards to how human beings learn, develop, grow, thrive. And a lot of it is still not reflected in many of our schools. This is just a few of the books that I pulled off my bookshelves here, laid them out on the carpet and took a photograph for this slide. There's so much that we know uh, now through neuroscience as well. And again, so much of it is not reflected in our current system of education. So if we take these three truths uh, and plot them in a Venn diagram, if you will, first of all, we are all part of the solution to de deconstruct systemic inequity and build schools that foster dignity and belonging for all children and all adults. Our task is to prepare children to thrive in an unknowable future. And a modern day school should evolve continually to ground its work in the science of learning and human development. And if we take each of these three truths, Okay, that's all fine and well, Julie, but what the heck do I do with that? You know, how do we begin to take these three truths and really look at either the school level, the district level, the education level, the classroom level, what might be helpful here? There are five decisions uh, that lie at the intersection of these three truths that will really help to build a system uh, moving forward that will support us. So what are those five decisions or five key questions? First of all, getting really clear on what's worth learning. Do we have a clear sense either as a school or a community, what's worth learning? 
that takes us back to the previous slide on the core and consensus of what we say is worth learning. Uh, now is a good time to reassemble ourselves, either at the school level, um, the community level, or even within your own classrooms. What am I saying is worth learning in my own classroom? What do I believe uh, is the best pedagogical approach? How is it best learned? Yes, there might be a timely lecture here and there. For the most part, I'm prepared to bet your answer is a deep inquiry-based, project-based learning approach. Uh, the inquiry-based approach is really uh, what helps push us to the edge of our own thinking. Uh, so really getting clear at the classroom, school and uh, system level how it's best learned. How do we know it has been learned? Assessment. How can we unleash teacher talent in support of this learning? I can't tell you how many times I have seen these lists of the skills, knowledge and habits of mind that we want our students to graduate with. Things like cre creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, compassion, collaboration. And the teachers aren't being afforded the same skills and knowledge building. We can't, we can't expect kids to graduate uh, as deep critical thinkers um, where their creativity has been honored if we don't provide the same opportunities for our teachers. And then the final question, how do I and we lead this level of change? Or more succinctly, we have the five biggies, curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, teacher, professional development, and change leadership. So, uh, my colleague Julie Stern and I, uh, Julie is the author of uh, Learning the Transfers, and she does tremendous work, uh, really translating conceptual understanding and how that can be used uh, in the classroom. And we're working to build several tools for teachers and leaders that will be helpful to translate all of this. So we've got the three truths and the five decisions. And this is a template uh, that we're really wanting to get out there and hoping it can be a template that teachers and leaders can use to really map, okay, what's our current state here and what might we want to build moving forward? So as you're viewing this in perusal, you know, I'd love to just to post a couple of comments or questions. And maybe there are a couple of um, comments that pop out to you here when you think about, okay, from my own class, you know, uh, how's it best learned you know, with regards to the science of learning and development. This is how I, this is how I teach. This is, these are the pedagogical principles, if you will, that I underpin, at, that underpin my work. Uh, or it might be, you know, when I think about our changing world, here's some professional development that I would really welcome. And this is what this might look like. So please feel free to go ahead um, and pause the video and note a few comments in perusal. It'd be great to pick up on those comments whenever we meet with, with Eric next month. So if you pause the video there, welcome back. Uh, Julie Stern and I are, are working this ourselves. And you'll see we've populated here. That's a lot of, um, a lot of boxes to take in. I'm happy to forward this uh, slide as, as a separate document if you would find it to be helpful. But this is our best thinking right now with, with what this might look like. And it provides, uh, it provides a tool to help help gauge, okay, where are we in present state and what might be some of our priorities moving forward uh, to really align the work that we're doing with the three truths and the five decisions. So this is the question that I spend the most of my time on. Uh, I meet a lot of teachers and leaders where they're saying, look, Julie, I get all of this. Uh, I believe that, you know, we need to really rethink the skills, knowledge and habits of mind uh, that are worthwhile, that we want our high school graduates um, to have as, as they move forward in the world. And, you know, there's, um, you know, I have my, my tool. I, 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 know how to, I know how to teach and how to teach this in a way that's immersive and that really um, motivates intrinsically and uh, really establishes autonomy and mastery uh, within my classroom. Uh, the challenge is I'm in a system uh, where I can't do what I want to do. So I like to think of change as it's top down, bottom up, inside out and outside in. And every single one of us has a role to play in leading this level of change. And there are a couple of 
tools that I would like to walk us through here. And then I would love uh, for us to start the discussion with Eric next month with your reflections on these. And I have a little bit of homework, which I'm going to give you, uh, which is entirely optional. You can uh, decide to do it or not do it. Uh, but it'd be great if you were to give some thought to it, um, as I think that would make for a very generative discussion next month. So the power of reflection. Uh, this is what I always encourage change agents. This is where I encourage them to begin, uh, the power of reflection. And you might have seen some version of the cold learning cycle before, where you have a concrete experience, you reflect uh, on that experience, you conclude, you draw your learning uh, from the experience that you just had, and then you try something new. And of course, life is an ever evolving, uh, hopefully upward spiral uh, in this adult learning cycle. And I am a massive fan of John Dewey and his great work. And I love this quote, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. So I would like to take us on an experience now uh, to help you dig into uh, basically your life path so far. And by really unpacking what I call your life map, what you can see there oftentimes are the seeds of your purpose here on this planet. And educators are among the most mission-driven, purpose people-driven that I know. Unfortunately, too often, the education system uh, can, it, it, it's almost like it strips that passion away, just the, oftentimes the relentless bureaucracy of it all. So my hope is through this exercise, you can tap back into that purpose, and we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. So your life map. I'm going to give you a few directions. I'll share my own life map, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, with another model. Okay, so your life map, thinking about your own life to date so far. So take a moment to reflect on the key events that you feel have really shaped your life, both negatively and positively. So you're going to pull out a blank sheet of paper or use your iPad, whatever your tool of choice is, and record your uh, date of birth on the left edge of the paper. And then you're going to draw a continuous line, mapping your life from the past into the future, mapping the high points with peaks and the low points with valleys. And then write a couple of words of description, uh, your age if you want to, at each of the peaks and, and peaks and valleys, peaks and troughs. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example in just a moment that will help paint the picture of what this might look like. Okay, so... Before you dive into your own, I will share my own example here. So 1974, that was my year of birth back in uh, Northern Ireland, 1974. Uh, I remember probably my first uh, valley or trough, if you will, was uh, my was my A level. So this is the exam that you take, uh, the exams you take at age 18 back in Northern Ireland in the UK, which decide which college or university you're going to go to. And I did not work hard enough. Uh, up until that point, I had been a pretty dedicated student, but I just, uh, I, I, I know I didn't work hard enough. I didn't put the work in and I didn't get the A-level results that I wanted to get. Uh, and, and that was the first time that I was really disappointed in myself, that I didn't step up in the way that I knew I could and should have. And I was really, really disappointed in, um, in the result that I got. Big high point was going to America for the first time. This was after I graduated college. Uh, I remember going out to San Francisco. That was my first port of call. And I remember taking one of those ferry rides and uh, taking the, the ride under the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was San Francisco and Marin County and Oakland, the East Bay. Next stop, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. And it just felt like, wow, um, the possibilities here were tremendous and I just got this great sense of expansiveness and possibility. My next valley uh, or trough, if you will, was a, a dreadful work experience where I had an extreme micromanager for a boss. It didn't matter how much work I did, it was never enough. Uh, there was never any positive feedback. It was just negative feedback on an ongoing basis. And I still remember that feeling, that grinding feeling in my stomach on a Sunday night at the thought of going into work the next day. 
And it, it, it really was, um, it was a good experience in that it, it helped me understand, okay, this is what uh, not to do as a manager or, or as a leader. But I really remember the, sort of the health impacts of that at the time. And then getting married, uh, that, was, that was a high point uh, for sure. And then uh, working on a startup. And uh, after an initial high with the startup, the cash flow took a much, lo much longer time to catch up with time than I thought it would. It was a pretty rough period for a number of years. Uh, we did struggle financially. And, and that, that, was, that was a very tough time uh, during that period. Then I went to Harvard. I got a job offer uh, to work at the Center for Workplace Development and uh, was reminded just walking through campus for the first time how much I love uh, walking through a college campus, just that sense of I'm surrounded by learning and possibility and new knowledge. Uh, it, was a, it was a real high point. Uh, got to work with a great team uh, doing work that I loved uh, as a training and development specialist and then a program manager, OD consultant and executive coach. That was... Uh, that was a real high point. Also at that time, I was accepted into the Graduate School of Education uh, to do my master's. And that was such a generative time working um, as a consultant coach during the day and then learning from the great theorists and practitioners uh, in the afternoons and evenings through my master's program. That was a real high point. My next low point uh, was getting divorced. Uh, at the time, it was a major shock to my system. I felt blindsided. Uh, in hindsight, the writing on, was on the wall. I just chose not to see it. And I remember sitting in, a, in my apartment uh, New Year's Eve uh, before my 40th birthday and thinking, okay, I am 3,000 miles away from my nearest family member. This was not exactly what I had in mind. Uh, I need to basically build a life from scratch. I have to build a life from scratch. Uh, that was a definite low point. Then uh, building myself uh, up from there, uh, met another wonderful guy by the name of Jay. We met uh, and shortly thereafter, I received um, an offer from Corwin to write the book, The Human Side of Changing Education. And that was a real thrill to be uh, given that contract and to work on the book and to spend days writing and really digging into uh, the research theory, um, calling all of my good friends and colleagues um, who do great work and learning from them. That was a real generative period. And then uh, probably uh, one of the major highlights was uh, get, getting unexpectedly pregnant at the age of 42. Uh, a massive surprise, Teddy was born. Uh, just, a, just an absolute, an absolute gift. And, you know, I thought I knew, <laughs> I thought I knew education, but there's nothing like having a, a four-year-old now to really help you dig deep into what your own thinking is and what, what actually matters. Uh, probably my lowest point to date in my life so far uh, was a period when uh, Teddy was in the ER and he almost died. And I could tell you my life before then and after then, things that I would worry about pre uh, Teddy almost dying, I don't worry about now because I, it just was this defining moment of really being given a two by four uh, to help me understand what actually matters in life. Uh, Teddy pulled himself out of that and, uh, and all is good. And the last couple of years, well, that's COVID. <laughs> the highs have, been, highs have been high, you know, hey, we're all good, you know, employed, you know, my family is healthy. And then, you know, the, um, some of the lower moments that have gone along with COVID. So it's interesting as you look across your own life map, uh, one of the threads uh, that has followed me whenever I started to unpack this was, I've always been fascinated by the question, is it possible to design, build and live a life of your own choosing? And that's why I uh, do the work that I do in education, because I believe if you've gone through you know, eight, 12, 16 years uh, of a system of learning, ideally you should be able uh, to design, build and live a life of your own choosing regardless of demography. And that's what really motivates me. And I can talk more about this when we meet uh, next month. But for now, I would love for you to sketch out your own life map and to bring that with you when we meet next month with Eric. 
So if it helps, here are some questions that you could answer along the way. So really think about those significant milestones and events in your life. Think about things that you're proud of, uh, big and small. What were you interested in as a child? And then what do you need to include uh, to make your life map more life map more rounded or complete? So next time when, we're meet, when we meet, we're going to dig into some of these questions. Uh, I won't go into these in detail, uh, but we'll talk about this in, uh, in a little bit more detail when we meet. Because where I want us to get to, uh, I love this quote, <laughs> that yes, life can only be understood backwards, but and it must be lived forwards. So I'm really looking forward to a rich discussion with you as you unpack your own life map as a human being, as an educator, and you think about where you are right now. You think about the state in which the world is. You think about your work moving forward, the changes you would like to see, the work that is in your heart to do as an educator. You're on a hero's journey. You are on a hero's journey. I'm going to give a a little bit of an overview of what we can expect here. And then we're going to dig into this in more detail when we meet. I also rephrase this as the learner's journey. Uh, again, educators are among the most mission-driven and humble people that I know. So I love to use this phrase, the learner's journey. Uh, we're all learning junkies uh, with my experience in the education system. So let's unleash that power on ourselves and our own development. So essentially, uh, the hero's journey, you might be familiar with the hero's journey and uh, Joseph Campbell's wonderful work uh, on the monomyth. It's essentially a shift from the known world to the unknown world. And it all starts with a call to adventure. So this is the change that you would like to see. Maybe it's the change you'd like to see in your classroom, maybe in your school, in your community, in the education system writ, uh, writ large. And almost immediately when we start to feel this call to adventure, the fear, uncertainty and doubts start to bubble up, oftentimes pretty quickly. I'm not qualified enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the resources. Who am I to think that I could do that? Oftentimes it's the inner critic, uh, for example, that can really start, um, start the negative talk, if you will. Then we have this experience of meeting the mentor. And the mentor can take many guises. It might be a colleague uh, of the hallway. It might be a family member, a spouse, a friend. It might be Eric. It might be somebody else within this broader community that you find yourselves here. Regardless, there's usually somebody or some entity that helps you make the shift from that known world to the unknown world. And you make that shift by taking action. And once you've uh, took the action, then you start to experience your challenges, the learning that you're here to learn and finding your tribe or your crew or the people who are on this similar path with you uh, very much within this network uh, in which you find yourselves right now as part of this. And then as you work through the unknown world, you will, you will more often than not uh, meet the abyss, meet the cave, meet uh, meet some of your deepest, darkest fears. And the deal with this part of the journey is nobody can go into that cave but you. That is your work to do and your work to do alone. And when I think back to my own life map, I remember really clearly that when I was having that pity party for myself on New Year's Eve, thinking I have to build an entire life from scratch here, it wasn't an overnight thing and it wasn't you know some you know epiphany uh, that came down. It was more a gradual realization that, oh, I don't have to, I get to. I get to design and build a life of my own choosing. And, oh, interesting, that's a question that has followed me ever since I, I was a kid. You know, is it possible to design, build, and live a life of your own choosing? So within that cave, uh, that's where the treasure lies, the boon, the, the learning uh, that you are there to learn. So then you take that learning uh, that new understanding and you share that um, and then you become the mentor to others. So it, it comes full cycle. So I would love us to unleash the power of our life map and our hero's journey as we seek to change the education, education system in which we find ourselves. And in my experience, the, the vast majority of educators with whom I meet, they have a very clear thing that they want to change. And I believe so strongly in the power of community to help make that happen. Nobody can do this work alone. 
And too often we try to, but there is such tremendous power in the collective. And I'm hoping that this network can help provide that support for you. I'll end with this final slide. Um, I encourage you to go to the companion website uh, for the book. There are a number of free downloadable resources there. Uh, there's also a hero's journey download that you can access on the website as well. So please do go ahead and download those ahead of when we meet next week, uh, sorry, next month. Uh, and I will go ahead and just stop the share on slides here and say that I can't wait to meet you next month. I'm curious to see what resonated with you and what I just said, what didn't, your comments, questions, rebuttals. We'll get into a robust discussion led by Eric. And I very, uh, very much look forward to meeting you next month. Thank you. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get started here because I, I am, I am uh, feeling that we're going to have quite an animated um, discussion. I, um, I told Julie before we opened the waiting room uh, that um, I was totally riveted by, by her talk. And uh, I literally sat on the edge of my chair and uh, I thought that there were so many you know, deep points raised that relate not just to education but but life as a whole and uh for that i'm i'm extremely grateful and i can't wait to further the uh the discussion and i hope that those of you who are here um join me in those um, in those feelings i'm eric mazur i'm on the faculty at harvard and i am um the pi for this uh, pulse t network uh it's been a pleasure to have all of you be part of it and many more people and to see some of you very regularly on these uh, saturday morning uh, morning talks our, our speaker today uh julie Jung jungawala uh no jungalwala pardon me um is education coach and an advisor to k-12 school leaders she is the founder and executive director of the Future of Learning, and her goal is to, I'm paraphrasing it here, sort of to help change the conveyor belt approach to education. Is that an appropriate metaphor, uh, Julie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's also the author of The Human Side of Changing Education, which I highly recommend, and uh, which forms the basis of the talk you, you watched in preparation of this meeting. So, I hope you made a life map, and uh, as the uh, as our homework assignment was, and uh, that you're ready to dive into uh, the discussion with me. So, I, I have a few things I want to ask, but I don't want to dominate the discussion. So, if you have any question, you can either put it in the chat or you can raise your electronic, and I will be moderating um, moderating the discussion. So, be sure to get in line by raising your um, your electronic hand. Um, so let me kick off here um, and, and then we'll, we'll talk to John since I said, let me kick off, I'll, I'll finish my sentence here. Um, Julie, you mentioned at one part, at one point in the talk that our goal as educators is to prepare our children for an unknown, or I think you're saying unknowable uh, future. And I don't know if you, you looked at the talk, but Joe Bellina said, uh, made a comment there that, that there's always been the mantra for liberal education. It's not really something new. And I, I think I agree with that statement. But in spite of that, I, I think it's a, it's a hard fact that most instructors around the world, of course not the people here who are conveyed conveyed here in this discussion, but most people around the world are are are, are really trying hard to make sort of mini me's out of their students, not not realizing that you know our students will you know not follow the same career path and follow in the footstep and 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 do the same thing. As a as a faculty member at Harvard, I'm probably entitled to no more than one successor 
one person who is going to become a physics professor like me. If that were not the case, then very quickly there'd be two of me and then four of me and eight of me. And, you know, soon the entire globe would be covered with, um, with physicists, which I do not think would be uh, a good thing. Um, so you, you, you ask, for example, um, the question, what is worse learning? And I, I thought about that a lot. There were a lot of interesting comments relating to that uh, topic. And the first one is Scott's um, uh, comment, which I think puts the finger right on the point that, that is on, on all of our, our minds. He said, Scott Wingerton, so thank you for that comment, Scott. It says, what I really struggle with is um, a fear of not properly preparing my students for their IP or AP exams. Mm -hmm. So much of education is dictated by outside factors that we have no control over as educators. I'm, I'm sure that in your work, Julie, you must encounter that comment and that barrier all the time. How, how do we tackle that? Yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges. And thank you for highlighting it, Scott. Uh, I do not have a nice, easy, tidy answer to address that one. If, if I did, we probably wouldn't be sitting around here having this conversation. It's uh, where we are at a moment in time, I believe in between systems that we're currently, the, most, the majority of us working in a system that is in decay, that was designed for a previous era and we are in the middle of, I mean, and with any process of decay, some things have got to die while something else is being reborn or born um, anew. And uh, there's a wonderful uh, author, Graeme Lester, uh, executive director at the International Futures Forum in Scotland. And he has this great phrase that I use all the time, which is, we are hospice workers to the old and midwives to the new. So with those of us who really embrace that role um, and say that standardized tests are the floor, not the ceiling, you know, what's, what's my alternative? Uh, I'll share a couple of examples of what, what I've seen out there, uh, but a really good friend of mine uh, up in Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts, Natalie, uh, she, whenever Common Core came in, uh, she still approached her work in the way she approached it and she, reverse engineered the standards into the back end. She didn't start with the standards, she reverse engineered them into the back end and covered, covered the bases. Uh, I remember visiting a school out in California and they were starting out, um, and I'm blanking the name, I have COVID brain, it is real. <laughs> I haven't been inside a school since March of 2020, um, where they started with a project-based interdisciplinary curriculum and then they started to actually get feedback from the students that we need prep for SAT. And the teacher said, great, let's have test prep. And it was explicitly, you know, here's the deep meaningful learning and here's test prep. And these are two separate things. And I thought it was brilliant the way in which they did that. And if there are ways in which um, we can help set those enabling conditions up in, in schools, I think that would be all the more, the more helpful. Uh, I've also heard of schools where uh, they have 20% time where teachers and students can work on deep, meaningful projects. So there, there are different creative ways to come at this. And uh, Scott, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges, thorny challenges of our time. I'm not sure if anybody else in the room here has any additional ideas or thoughts on how, how they've addressed this in their own classroom. That's an, an interesting point. And I suggest that you put that in the chat. There, there's already a, a little bit of chat, uh, but since John has had his hand up patiently there, I suggest that um, we pass it on to, um, to him. So if you could briefly introduce yourselves um, for Julie and the others, that'd be terrific. Yeah, hi, I'm John Rader, a physics teacher at the Calhoun School in New York City. And when I watched your video, I was fascinated especially by your lists. You had the list of characteristics of industrial schools and your suggested characteristics of post-industrial schools. And you followed that by a from list and a to list. And 
it took me back to back in the 90s, right after the National Science Education Standards came out. And I remember attending a presentation by Karen Wirth, uh, which listed the difference between before those standards and the goal after in a less than and, and more of. Hmm. And uh, hmm. I noticed, though, that in your listings of the uh, areas of growing concern, you did not list either the national science education standards or the more recent next gen uh, generation science standards. And I was wondering, uh, what is your opinion of those and how that uh, you feel those standards fit in your scheme of going from uh, industrial to post-industrial? I would need to sit down with those standards. I, I'm unfamiliar with those standards, John. Could you tell me what they are? Oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> uh, basically, the national science education standards, uh, the, the buzzword for that was inquiry. And then what happened is all the publishers grabbed onto that and they were advertising that they were providing inquiry. And okay. deliberately, the next generation science standards did not use that word, but they have three dimensions of the uh, standard uh, topics. They have a list of science and engineering practices and a list of cross-cutting concepts that are all to be integrated. But mm -hmm. still, I, I think uh, both of the sets of standards would uh, look be looked upon kindly by you as part of the uh, post-industrial, but mm -hmm. if you've not had a chance to see them, I, I will just recommend that you do. Okay, and, I'll uh, absolutely check those out. I'll, I'll, I'll pass the baton on to the next questioner. Thank you. Thank but you. I really enjoyed your video. Thank you, John. And, and that's encouraging on, that, on those standards. I'm curious, other folks in the room, have you had experience of those standards? Maybe are you but actively I think working what with it's them? told us is that we're still in the process of implementing them because we went from the 90s to the teens uh, in going from one set of standards to the other. And they're not that different, but still we have a preponderance of people memorizing information in mm. your uh, list of what's happening in the uh, industrial school. Hmm. Thank you, John. Nicole, I saw you nodding your head there. Are you actively using these standards? I'm, I'm curious. Um, well, I live in Texas and Texas didn't adopt next gen, but I've also taught in Tennessee and Florida where they did. And I've worked, uh, worked with an education reform company that was actively as next gen was coming out, trying to figure out the best ways for teacher to, teachers to implement those. Um, my question, however, is about the um, exodus of teachers, which we are experiencing a lot of in the state of Texas. And I think that it is even um, more uh, more of a problem in science because you know if i've got somebody with a degree in biochem uh, they don't have to teach they can make twice as much money and be treated well working as a biochemist and you know myself with physics degrees i have other options and more and more of our science teachers especially in texas our pay is very low um, are leaving the profession and the the only people that are coming in to replace them are people who are graduating from college which is great i find brand new teachers, very moldable and easier to, to, to kind of train and get them in that inquiry mindset. But I feel, I fear that we are also going to run out of people that are interested in starting in education. So do you have any ideas, suggestions, you know, maybe something motivational to try to encourage our teachers to stay in a classroom? I wish I did. Uh, I'm probably going to tell you something you don't want to hear, Nicole. Um, but I try to stay in reality as much as I can. This is a system in decay, as evidenced by the fact that pre-COVID, these jobs were unsustainable, never mind amidst a global pandemic. Pre-COVID, there's something fundamentally wrong with the job that requires two months off to be able to physically and mentally recuperate from what went down uh, to preparing for the next, the next academic year. And again, the teacher role uh, is, an artifact of a previous era, going from you know, books being held by the church, printing press, 
teacher was the only person with the knowledge of this particular content area in this particular community to, you know, not too many years, fast forward, internet. And the question is not, can I access knowledge, but what knowledge am I accessing? What's the provenance? What's the source? You know, and, and who's that source? And, and, and digging further, further down. I believe the teacher role is, it should be completely redesigned. And for teachers, it's almost been a like profession by barnacle where another thing is added on, another thing is added on, another thing is added on, and nothing is taken away. And you can only put so much on somebody's plate. And you know, I've had a magic wand. I, I think every teacher should start out at six figures. If you can start out in a consulting company at six figures, I think every teacher should start at six figures. Uh, and that would have a tremendous impact on, on the profession. Um, we know that's unlikely to happen, at least in the near future. But I, I, I was thinking about, um, when you ask that question, uh, Kelly Young from Education Reimagined, she's the leader uh, of Education Reimagined. And they're thinking about actively building models around learning ecosystems. So when you even think of, you know, what might happen now as we, if we're emerging from COVID or if we're in between variants, either way, the entire system has been shook up for two years. So what decisions will we make moving forward? What decisions will parents make moving forward? If my kid wasn't happy in school before, are there now, can I cobble together some different options for my kid, which will all amount to a good education? Again, even pre-COVID, homeschooling was starting to increase. And one of the biggest reasons for parents opting out and, and homeschooling their kids uh, was bullying and their kids just mentally and physically not thriving within the public school environment. So if we think about these learning ecosystems, what could be the potential role for experts in physics and pedagogy within a community? Now it brings up massive questions around, well, how do you fund that? And what's the budget and sourcing and how you're going to bring that together. But we are at this moment in time where I think these kinds of conversations are possible. Uh, I know all of that is like it's way up there. Uh, and your question was, you know, how to give some, some hope and some sense of, sense of possibility. You're asking yourself, what is your job and what is your work to do? And am I able to do that in the environment in which I find myself? And am I adequately compensated? And is my heart in it? Or is there a, a quiet voice saying, no, you need to leave, or no, it's something else, or this additional piece? And I can't answer that question. Uh, that, that's an individual question. So, um, Christy Jirachi has her. Um, and uh, I had actually written down one of your questions, Christy, because I thought it was a really good one. I don't know if that's what, that's what you're uh, going to ask about the dichotomy between uh, change at the um, departmental level and individual level, which I think we should discuss at some point. Uh, but I'll happy to give the floor to you. Thank you. You read my mind. <laughs> good morning, everyone. I'm out in Phoenix, so just had my first cup of coffee if I seem a little foggy. <laughs> and um, I came to uh, listen to your talk a bit late. I listened to it. I finished it two minutes before this discussion. Um, thank you to Jane Jackson for telling me about it only a few days ago. I really enjoyed it. And what struck me is what um, I think Eric brought up, this dichotomy that I see between what schools are publicly willing to say they do to embrace the future of learning and what really happens at the departmental level. And what I wanted to ask was in your role working with school leaders, how many of those school leaders, especially in science, have had experience both in a laboratory setting, doing science, administering science education and teaching science. Um, I come, teaching is my third career, I think. I started out as a researcher, I'm an insect systematist, I did my postdoc at the Smithsonian with Terry Irwin in a biodiversity lab. And so I worked in a museum and then I was a AAAS science and technology policy fellow. 
applying science research to the policy realm for education. Wow. And then I went into teaching. Well, then I went into research. I worked in Iraq for a while, starting a new um, science department at a American University of Iraq. And then I came into K-12 education. So I don't know if that's three or four careers. And I'm finding that I am often a diplomat between folks who have never been a scientist and have only taught science, folks who have only, you know, the opposite of that, and then folks who have, are administering education who have neither done science nor taught science, which are most of my bosses. So I find this great irony in folks who are willing to accept, oh, yes, let's do these new things, inquiry-based this, and, and let's have conversations in class and slow down and not try to cram in every single scientific principle that's ever been discovered in physics, chemistry, and biology. And those who are in the classroom who feel like we're not being heard. So mm -hmm. I wondered if in your conversations you have a breakdown of, or at least some anecdotal knowledge of what the backgrounds are of the folks who are writing the standards, administering the schools, writing the tests, and are any of those aligned to the folks who are actually in the classrooms with the teachers every day? Uh, typically not, uh, for the most part. And that's not to say that aren't you know, bright points of light out there where teachers are front and center uh, working uh, with leaders on standards and what it is that we're well, we're really asking those questions what's worth learning how's it best learned how can we get it taught that way and how do we know it has been learned uh, but again it, it speaks to a system in decay where so much of this atomized with strict you know lines of demarcation and you know we all stay in our own swim lanes and we, we don't have the conversations that we need to have I'm struck by how practical your experience is how diverse your experience is and how ideally you should be in a leadership and teaching position at the same time. Uh, this gets to, and this is in higher ed as well, uh, which is the extraordinary pressure of teaching, research and leadership and how we're expecting one person to do all three and to do it at a level of excellence. So I think we really need to rethink these roles uh, and, and maybe it, not quite as much in the independent schools, but still in a lot of public schools, uh, the kind of experience that you have, kids don't have access to that. I mean, if I were in your class, I'd be asking you all manner of questions about you know, your, your travels and your thinking. And, and that's just, that's a very different example for me as a young girl to have you as a teacher in that classroom. Uh, and, and it definitely speaks to what we need to see more of. And my hope is that you would play a role in pushing the system as well. You're in a position to be able to do that. Thank you, I appreciate that, that feedback. Um, the other part of the irony I've discovered is I found I'm able to do all of those roles in a small classical school that requires all students oh. to take biology, chemistry and physics in high school and teaches Latin to all middle school students and Greek to those who want it. So my, wow. what's sustaining me and keeping me in my teaching position, even though I know I could go off and do other things, is um, learning Greek and working with the Greek and Latin teachers to try to um, learn Greek by reading Aristotle's Historium Automalium. Wow. And that's not anything I have ever been able to do in a large district school. So I don't know if it's the fact that we say we're this traditional one track curriculum, yet we really do embrace a lot of innovative strategies. We just mm -hmm. don't say we do, or whether it's because we're small and nimble. That we're a speedboat well, and not the Titanic. But what I hear sort of embedded in what you're saying is as a teacher, you have choice, you have autonomy, and you have the potential to learn something very meaningful to you. And you've got good relationships with your peers. Absolutely. And my boss is a, scientist who worked in the science lab. It's okay. Wonderful. <laughs> so you found your sweet spot. Yes. And, and, and this is what's possible you know, from a human perspective. If schools are able to set up the conditions where as a teacher, you're able to learn, you're able, and, and not just learn, but like develop deep mastery and have your thinking, you know, completely tilted with let me learn Greek and let me learn something else. And to do that within a community of practice where I feel supported, 
you know, in the hero's journey, uh, uh, one of the elements of the hero's journey that oftentimes doesn't get a lot of, lot of conversation is the importance of community. I mean, do not do this work alone. <laughs> do not try to do any sort of change-oriented work alone. And it sounds like you've got a great community there behind you. That's fantastic. You're in your spot, love it. Please do, if you're not blogging, um, please do get your, get your thinking out there. Christy, thank you for that. And, um, and uh, I think that um, what, uh, what you said, Julius, I think we all, we, you know, the change that we're trying to implement is, uh, is a really, really huge one. It, it is like moving a mountain and we all need to, you know, move a few stones in order to ultimately, uh, ultimately move the mountain. Yesterday I was a talk, I was at a talk by Bruce Graham um, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's really focused on transforming engineering education at the um, university level. And um, she has been commissioned by a number of places to do studies on the, on the status of, uh, of engineering education, one for the Royal Academy of Engineering, another one for MIT. And um, one of the things that struck me from that report is that the schools that are the most innovative share sort of two common traits. One is they tend to be the newer ones, the ones that have been started sort of in the last 10 years and they don't have tenure. Hmm. Um, you know, so there's more of an incentive for people to try to push the limit and to try to uh, move, the, uh, move the barrier. Um, Maybe we should, um, you know, given that we already have, you know, spoken here for half an hour, maybe we should very quickly uh, get to the um, to the life map. So I asked I asked uh, Sarah to quickly put together a poll. Um, if you could send it out, and people could uh, start uh, answering it, I'd be very curious to know uh, where we stand with this um, uh, audience. So. Let's see if you're as good in doing homework assignments as you expect your students to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I was hoping that there would be at least one choice in the last category. Uh, but I'm happy to see that, that more than half a dozen people uh, did, um, did do their uh, life map. So, so Julie, I mean, <clears throat> what do you think? How, how, how would you like to take it from here? Uh, well, I, I'm curious, I mean, you know, it's a Saturday. We're all here of our own free will. Uh, the, the folks who thought about it and, and didn't get to it, you know, I'd be interested to know, to know why. You know, zero judgment, let, let's just have a, a chat about, well, you know, what, what are the reasons are, why? Um, and the folks who did do it, uh, were there any takeaways that you'd be willing to share or puzzles that I might be able to help with? I see Scott, you've raised your hand there. Scott. Yeah, I can, I can say that um, I, I started doing it and I was doing it. And one thing I realized were points in my life. Well, I guess at first I should say, I was really brave of you to do that. And it was really, uh, I appreciate that. First of all, Julie, you, you sharing that with us. And it was a really um, insightful exercise. And I noticed that as I was going through mine, <clears throat> there was, I couldn't place them, whether it was high or low. And particularly it was the Peace Corps when I joined the Peace Corps right out of college, undergraduate school. And it was, it was both at the same time. It was one of the highest and one of the lowest points of my life simultaneously. Hmm. And, um, you know, there've been clearly all high points and clearly all low points, but um, there were a couple like that, that I, that I noticed. Did you ever notice that? You weren't really sure whether to put it up or down? Uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. for, for sure. And I, I think we all have different versions of a life map. Life map. You know, mine was a pretty high level life map. There are lots of, you know, <laughs> highs and lows in between like the big ones that, that I highlighted there. Uh, and, and for sure, a, a single experience, uh, oftentimes a period in time, 
Peace Corps is a great example. Scott can be, you know, equal parts highs and lows. Uh, one of the biggest things that I hope folks take from the life map is, first of all, just, just making it conscious, your life so far, you're living a narrative. And it can be really, and you know, the second piece that I usually follow up with is, if that's your life so far, you know, <laughs> you get another blank piece of paper, what, what might you want to design moving forward? What might that look like? You can't know the highs and lows thinking forward, but what are some pieces you would like to see potentially on a life map in hindsight 10 years from now? Um, I will say, I'll, I'll speak to my own experience, I'd be interested in yours. Those lower moments, that's when I really learned. Those were the big lessons. The high points were nice, but I didn't learn anything in particular. You know, it was more so, you know, when I did my grad level work, I was just so energized uh, and I was energized because of the contrast from my previous experience where I just wasn't working as hard as I knew I could be. I wasn't as engaged as I knew I could be and you know, distilling the learning from that. There is a certain amount of, you know, I was 30 versus 18, therefore, <laughs> you know, my older self, I was able to make some different choices. Uh, but the, you can have an experience and it's equal parts, the highs and lows, like Teddy in the ER. I, mean, I literally, you know, I thought my life had stopped at that point and then he was okay. So like, that, was a, that was a massive plunge, but then like, oh, I, I didn't put it in there, but then like a massive jump up, you know, he's okay. Uh, and that was that, that was that single event, just as one example. Contrast is also uh, important for context. Yes. Mm. And, and, and contrast, I remember um, doing the life map, uh, actually was a previous workshop participant, and she said, you know, if you'd asked me this six months ago, this, this valley, it would have hit the floor and maybe the basement. But now I've got some mm. perspective. It's not as low. I'm not putting it as low today. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not this fixed entity, if you will, if you're to revisit it every year or every five years, you probably would find things would shift uh, Absolutely. as you take on different perspective. Mm. Thank you. Actually, Scott, th that was really interesting what you mentioned uh, right there for the contrast, right? I mean, without, without highs, you have no lows and without lows, you have no highs. Right, right. right. Uh, um, so, so, so the contrast is important. What, what I was wondering, Julie, was how do you use your life map to pave out your future? To, yeah. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is, as you look at your life map uh, and start to uh, look at the themes, does a purpose and or passion start to emerge for you? Are there themes? So this is, for example, this is when I feel most alive or of most value to the world. Uh, these have been my biggest learnings. Uh, on that hero's journey, that narrative arc, uh, whenever you find yourself in that lowest point, that cave, that's the treasure or the boon, if you will, that you will take forward and bring to the known world and be a mentor to others. So, in your life and work so far, what have been those lowest points where you've learned the most? Uh, anytime somebody's going through something deeply traumatic, uh, I oftentimes, well, I, I've got great empathy for it. And then I'm also thinking at the same time, okay, how is this, what this person's going, going through, how will, that, how will they take that and help others? Not right now, because it's too raw or it's too recent or it's, it's too much right now. But I believe uh, at a really high level, Life happens for you, not to you. And if you take that lens, uh, there is a, a depth there that if you mine it, make it conscious, and then bring that to the world, it's, it, people really gravitate towards it. It's so real. And you're showing up as the most, I mean, this word gets banned about so much, authentic, authentic self, you know, insert buzz buzzword. If you're really showing up as, the true version and the, the core and best version of who you are, then you start to magnetize like people and you find yourself asking the questions you're here to ask. Um, in my experience, it's rare that it pops out. 
look, oh, I can see my purpose, you know, immediately from this life map. Sometimes that's the case, sometimes not. Work can really be very helpful if you were to partner with another colleague, maybe somebody you know here in this network. So let's, let's look at our life maps. And if you have an empathetic listening partner who can re reflect back to you what they're noticing, it can be incredibly powerful because oftentimes we're so deep in it ourselves, we, we don't know. So, or, or, we, or we just can't see it as clearly. And then seeing what some of the themes might be, uh, I oftentimes ask, and particularly my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, what questions are you asking yourself? And those questions can oftentimes speak to, okay, what might the future, what might you want to design and build in the future? Now, it's important to recognize the questions you're asking yourself on two levels. One, these can be negative questions, which are actively unhelpful. So, you know, why am I not good enough? You know, why? And, and really beating yourself up. Um, and again, don't beat yourself up for beating yourself up at that point. You know, notice it. Okay. Uh, I've noticed it. What, what other more generative questions might I be asking myself? That would be, that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, I've always had it since I've been a kid. You know, is it possible to design and build and live a life of your own choosing, regardless of demography. And I've morphed it a little bit in the last number of years to be that question plus, and for the betterment of humanity. Because otherwise, you know, why are we here? <laughs> if it's just, you know, you and me trying to be the best we can be, well, that's good, but you know, there has to, we are all part of a whole. And if we're not recognizing the whole, then we are screwed. And there's enough data right now to tell us that we haven't learned those lessons. Um, it's a very long-winded answer. To your question, Eric, I would say a, a trusted thought partner can really help draw out oftentimes what we can't see ourselves. But even in the, I think even in the absence of, of, a, of, a, of a trusted partner, the, the act of reflection, I think is really important. It, it, it all comes down to metacognition in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I was reminded of that when I saw um, Andrea McPhee's uh, comment in the chat says it's exactly like the um, we need to make mistakes so we can learn things we try to teach our students and 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 I, I remember you shared the quote by John Dewey uh, saying it's it's we don't learn from experiences we learn from reflecting on experiences I I didn't know that quote I think it's an absolutely brilliant uh, quote and um, that is maybe something that we should inculcate much more in education as a whole uh, reflection and, and, and give students an opportunity to evaluate their own learning and uh, to learn how to evaluate their own learning. I think that's mm -hmm. uh, that would be another huge step forward in education across the board from you know early grades to, to graduate uh, level because mm -hmm. that's what keeps us going in life you're just reminding me um we discussed uh, in, in the group yet um austin's butterfly no by, by ron berger uh there's a, if you just google it there's like a six or maybe a 13 minute youtube video clip where he has a group of young children and he asks them to draw a butterfly and then as a class they they, they observe a picture of a butterfly and really start to notice the butterfly. So they actually, he doesn't use this language, but they start to build a rubric <laughs> as a group for, the, for how to draw a butterfly. And then they give each other feedback. The, the kids do, what do you notice about each other's drawings? And when you compare Austin's butterfly, I think there are four, maybe five iterations. It's like two different artists. It, it's like the, the, the first one is the kids painting a butterfly. And the final one, you think it was an 18 year old drew that butterfly with with good artistic skills it, it's phenomenal just to see the compare and the contrast one of the biggest potential levers in any classroom is not just assessment you know of the learning but as learning and for learning and mm -hmm. you know I, I think back to my own experience if i'd been asked to assess my own work and to assess a peers and for them to give me feedback that would be a very different experience. The learning would go 
so much, so much deeper. Because anytime I hand in something for, you know, to be assessed, the only thing you're looking for, is it an A or not an A? That's the only thing as a student that you're looking for. They're, they're basically two, grad, two grades right now in America, A or not A. And all the work that I know the teacher would have put in with the comments and et cetera, for the most part ignored. You're, you're looking for the grade because again, it's, it's the way the system's built. The system rewards the grade. The system doesn't actually reward learning for the most part. Right, I mean, because there's a hidden underlying assumption that uh, the grade measures learning, yes. <laughs> which <laughs> as we know, I remember. Necessary... I, I wish I had pulled the article and I, I, I have Googled it and I can't find it, but I remember reading an article one time uh, and this is in a, an independent school where the test that the students had taken was in chemistry, I'm, I'm blanking on the subject, the exact same test they took in May, they were given it when they came back, September, October. Every single kid got at least two, if not three grades less. So, you know, we're teaching to the test, it's part of the system. Uh, it's short-term recall that's being tested for the most part. Uh, I want to give a, a shout out here. Um, to some of the most innovative work that I'm seeing in assessment right now from next generation learning challenges and how they're thinking about this continuum. Because yes, I mean, there is content that needs to be learned and we need to think about this, not get out of these dichotomies that we've found ourselves in and what the, how they're framing this and how they're thinking about assessment. Uh, it really um, gets to the core of, as we seek to build a modern day system of education, if we had a modern day system of education, what would that look like? Uh, I, I think it would look a lot like what's described here. Mm -hmm. Good, I see. And you know, I mean, the, the, the threat of assessment is, and, 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 and I don't know if the, the audience will agree with me, but it's something that has been coming up over and over again in different forms in, in, in the talks that we've heard over the past uh, year and a half. I think it's a, it's a major uh, nut to crack. And, uh, and, and, and I think as, as soon as we can shift away from being slaves to simple numerical metrics of performance, I think we might, we might put the focus back on the, on the, on the real learning. Donna, you have your hand up. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, I have a student recently that she's an excellent student, um, but she this was in chemistry and she had to work hard and she was she was making a B and she dropped the course because she wasn't making an A and mom supported that. And I'm in a small school where like CJ, I have, I have the ability, I have a lot of autonomy. I have a lot of freedom to, to use the practices that I feel are most effective. Although it's a private school, so my students and their parents are, are customers. So um, in, in thinking about that, um, that life map and how the growth comes from these difficult things that we've come through the other side and reflected and gone, okay, wow, look what, you know, like I'm a better person or I've learned these things or I'm tougher than I thought I was. But how, do, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, give my mom lectures and say that to them, like, you can do this, do the hard things, the hard things are worth doing. And they're just like, I'm not going to get an A, so I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm not quite sure, like, how do you, how do you speak to people? How do you sell that to them? Like hard things are worth doing. They're not fun. It's not fun to do hard things, whether, whether you're choosing to do a hard thing or, or a hard thing is, has, you know, entered your life, not by your choice, but how do you, how do you sell 
it is worth the struggle because you are going to have a grit and determination and resilience once you get on the other side, even though you may not have an A. Mm -hmm. And um, she was completely capable. I mean, she definitely should have been in that class. And I was just like, how could I have, how could I have handled this better? Mm. Well, let me ask you first, before I share my thoughts, how might you have handled it better? Do you have any initial thoughts yourself, Donna? I don't know. I asked her to, she, she brought me the piece of paper that I had to sign that said that she could drop the class. And, and I said, could you just talk to your mom about this and, and, you know, pray about it and, and just reflect on it just a little bit before you, I said, I'm not going to try to stand in your way, or if that's what you and your mom have decided that is right for you, I'll sign it, but just give it a few more days. I don't know that she really did, but she did bring it back a few days later. Um, I'm not sure they, you know, I'm trying to teach them like they want, they want the shortcut. They want, you know, they're, they're immature. They want the shortcut. I want to Google my answers just to get it done. And you can't shortcut learning. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's there. Learning is a struggle and they, they just want a quick, you know, can I just Google it and write something down? Yeah. Yeah. The challenge is, uh, the, we embrace the struggle when we embrace the ends. So all of this is means right now. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the extent to which this would have been possible, Donna, um, to ask that student, you know, think about, and I'm going to do much more of this across the board. Think of your life after school. Let's think of your life. Mm-hmm. What are you interested in? Well, and I did, I did ask her that I said, you know, like, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to be a lawyer, so I don't need chemistry. And I said, but in law school, you're going to have to do things that are much more difficult than this little high school chemistry class. You'll Mm -hmm. have to do much harder things and you can't just come up to something that's difficult and quit. You can, you can do this thing. So, I mean, I, I talked to her about it, but I didn't, I wasn't really very successful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be the case that that was the right choice for her. You know, it, she, it, right. She's saying, Absolutely. I want to be a lawyer and I'm, I'm making some choices here, but it sounds like it's not for you. It wasn't chemistry for you. It was, it's really important to me that every student in my class learns resilience. Yes. And learns how to push through um, the hard times and doesn't just quit at the first sign of an obstacle. So I think Absolutely. that's the, the, the meta picture here is how can you build that into your curriculum over the narrative arc of a semester to give students the experience of having approached something difficult and then conquered it. And then back to Eric's point around metacognition, being able to take a step back and, and be able to say, I did that. Not just I did that thing and checked it off, but I had an obstacle and, and, and this is how I typically handle obstacles. This is what I learned about myself in that process. So they can then take that forward and talk about what they learned about themselves from that process. It sounds like that would be really engaging to you as a teacher to mine for that and to set the conditions in the classroom where there's permission to do that. All so would you, what kind of a reflective activity yeah. would you do with high schoolers? Uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts, but again, I'd love to get, is, is, is there somebody else? I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to hog all your time. I'm Wait, just like, no, no, there was some audio. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, but yes. So it goes back to, you know, how you set the class up at the beginning of the academic year. And as a teacher, you're saying that for me, what, what, what I deem is worth learning is resiliency. And this is how this is going to look like in chemistry. Maybe you're going to set up a project and you're not only going to debrief the content of what people are learning. What are you learning about yourself as a scientist? Mm-hmm. Uh, I coach junior faculty and mid through senior faculty in higher ed. And oftentimes one of the things that they struggle most with is students struggling with the fact that I put in three, four years of work and I didn't get published. When the junior faculty or the faculty members trying to reorient their thinking to what did you learn? This is science. This is, Mm -hmm. we're not starting out with any sort of guarantee here. You know, 
if you're a true scientist, why would you bother? Because, you know, the answer's already known. You're, you're actively in pursuit of new knowledge. So in Miss Donna's classroom, we are actively in pursuit of new knowledge or, or whatever it is that really helps folks see that it's not chemistry for chemistry's sake, but there is this bigger aim that is important to you and which you believe mm -hmm. will help them, which is resilience. And this is what that looks like in this classroom. And we're going to reflect on that skill, habits of mind, uh, as well as the content that you'll be learning. I like that. I like that. And I think, I think especially, um, you know, there is a different, a difference in these students that have grown up with, um, with the internet, with um, the ability to Google things with, there is a sense of, you know, just instant, it's you know, amazing. like, like a drive-through and learning is not a drive-through mm -hmm. and um, just, trying to, um, I think that would be very worthwhile. I like what you, what you had to say. Mm -hmm. I'm really getting a sense of what's important to you as a teacher. And chemistry is your vehicle. Mm -hmm. Well, this, and yes. This love and pursuit of learning and chemistry is the perfect vehicle for it. So let's embrace the magic of this and the mystery of this and the potential self-discovery of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the frame for your classroom. I like that. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have, um, I think we have time for one more question. We have one uh, hand up. Um, Manuel Martinez from Honduras. How nice. Mucho gusto. Hello. Nice to see you again, uh, Professor. Uh, oh, Eric. More than Eric. A... Eric. Eric. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, more than a question, it's like a comment as an outsider, maybe I can give my two cents. Uh, well, I, well, while I was doing my master's at Iowa University, uh, thanks to a Fulbright uh, last Bell scholarship, I noticed like the cultural differences between, you know, the Honduran education system and the US education system when, when it comes to, com you know, competition and all that. I, I was, uh, well, uh, educated in a bilingual school, you know, with American teachers also, uh, both programs, but like going uh, to the States and looking at kids that want to go to med school, like kill each other, you know, over grades, like, you no, know, there's some sort of squid game, you know, they're not, they're, they don't want to get A's, they are forced to get A's, you know, in, in order to get into good schools and then, you know, apply to med school. You know, it's not that they want to, you know, it's not that they don't, they don't want to learn, but they are they are forced to compete. So, you know, it's, it's not their fault, it's the system's fault, you know? So it's more than what you could do. It's like, there's need to be a systemic change. It's not just, you know, what you're willing to do or you want to, to help, you know, them achieve. It's like more than that, you know? It's just my two cents, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, uh, Manuel. Good. Well, we have we have uh, time for um, for one more question. That's wonderful. I um, I certainly have a few more things I'd like to raise. I think, but I I want to be sure that I, everybody here has an opportunity. Jolene. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, your kids. This is where my video wasn't on before. But um... <laughs> hi, Jolene. <laughs> I just, um, one, I loved everything. I, I love the discussion. But as someone who teaches in Title I schools and just listening to teachers, it just, the equity issue so concerns me. And I have no, like, I don't see a solution, but I hear, right, all teachers are struggling hardcore right now. And I think about all my teacher friends who are in Title I schools like me, and we're struggling even harder with all of these same things and have no support. And our students are getting the worst of everything. And you can only survive so long as a teacher, right? Trying to give all of your own mental health to the students. So it's not really a question, but like any ideas on what, if anything can be done to support these schools where they're just not getting anything. That was a huge question, Jolene, that gets to uh, the social fabric and where we are right now it was untenable pre-covid and 
I mean, COVID didn't manufacture anything that didn't exist before. Uh, it's essentially, at least my, my experience, it lifted a veil. It, it, was, all, it was already there. Uh, there's a fantastic um, article that Aaron Dathy Roy wrote uh, in the Financial Times, I'm not sure if you've read it or not, called Pandemic as Portal. And uh, I don't have a, anything approximating a solution for you, Jolene, but I will, I want to read part of that um, article because when I myself feel like, you know, this system is just way bigger than I am and what the heck am I doing? Um, I read this. Well, we're, we're ending on a profound note here. And I see that Isa has her hand up with uh, so brief question, brief uh, answer. So, uh, I'll, just, I'll just share a couple of sentences here. Um, okay. What is this thing that has happened to us? It's a virus, yes, in of itself, it, it holds no moral brief, but it is definitely more than a virus. Some believe it's God's way of bringing us to our senses, others that it's a Chinese conspiracy to take over the world. Uh, and then there are just a couple of paragraphs here. Uh, Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Great. Um, Isa, I'll give you the last word. Yes, thank you. This has been such a great discussion. And I want to conclude by bringing uh, up a thread that has come up in the discussion a couple of times. And, and the thread or the theme is, you know, and you've addressed it already in a sense by discussing how much teachers should be compensated. But it's this idea that, for example, I think it was Jolene and there were a couple others who pitched in, you can have the, the perceived uh, prestige and value that a university professor has versus the, the perceived prestige and value that a high school teacher has. And a lot of our members um, and a few who have been active in the chat have experienced this firsthand because they make that transition where they go from being a researcher or being a university faculty member I myself, in a sense, um, can relate to this because I transitioned from being in a PhD program in genetics, and then I went into education, and I received a lot of feedback from people in my science community about how this was a mistake, and from family and friends who didn't understand why I would make this transition. So then my question is, is how to, um, how can we use this wonderful tool that you've brought to us today, the life map, to um, maybe as a reflection tool or as a reminder for why we have made these transitions, why they matter as a way to maybe counter some of that messaging that we're constantly getting that, you know, just doesn't help the difficult work already. Thank you. Yeah, the, the counter messaging is hard uh, and people, other people have ideas about us. Uh, and. I go back to Robert Keegan's work on adult development, where he talks about the stages of childhood, adolescence, socialized mind, self-authoring mind, and transformational mind. And I think we're in this um, shift right now. Uh, I think COVID is accelerating it between socialized and self-authoring mind. According to Keegan's research, the majority of adults are either socialized in the so socialized self-authoring shift, if you will. Mm -hmm. The life map helps you to be more self-authoring. When I look back at the narrative thus far of my life, what have I learned? And if I take a victim stance and say, this has all happened to me, then you're going to be at the, at the whim of whomever tells you whoever you are. But if you take the, the lens of this has happened for me, given that, what am I learning? What is meaningful to me? What do I stand for? And then how might I show up like that daily? And then thinking out, okay, 10 years from now, 
do I have a North Star, personally and professionally? And then don't wait 10 years. What skills or what way of being can I pull down from that 10-year vision and start operating in that way right now? And having folks like CJ stand up in a school community and talk about what she knows, she will start to shift perceptions of, quotes, just a teacher. And don't get me started on that, <laughs> that line. It is the most extraordinary job. And the more you ground yourself in your personal vision and mission, the stronger you will show up. Thank you. That helps. Wonderful. Uh, we've uh, reached the end of our, um, of our time. Uh, Julie, I, I, I think I speak on behalf of all of us that uh, this was just an absolutely um, fantastic talk you gave. Uh, and a fantastic discussion that we had here. We, I think we could have gone on for quite a bit longer, um, but we've already imposed on your time for which we are very, very grateful. So on behalf of, um, of all of us, a, uh, a both a virtual and a, and a real uh, applause. And uh, we hope to, to have you back sometime in the future to continue this discussion. Um, to everybody else, so yes, sorry, I don't know if you were, were no, just saying thank you, thank you for having me, thank you everyone. Well, the, the, we are the ones who um, who are uh, grateful. So this will likely be the last talk of the 2021-2022 season. Uh, Julie, you've raised the bar. It's going to be too difficult to find somebody to <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to 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 engage us at anything near the level that you engaged us. So all all of the talks are on the um, Pulse to YouTube channel. In case you want to um, look back, we're sort of in a planning stages of the of the summer conference so stay tuned for more information and also if you have ideas please contribute them uh, to us email me or sarah or uh, put it on our, our our slack so sarah will be sending out a follow-up email with a participation certificate with a brief questionnaire and we'll use the questionnaires for planning future events so please 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 take a minute to fill it out so we can better serve you as a uh, community. And I mentioned Slack. It's a platform to facilitate communication. Many of you are already on there. If you're not on there, Sarah will put a link in the chat, which you can just click in order to uh, to join. We also, in, in part inspired by, um, by Rob Crickle's um, interest in social media, we started a Pulse T-Net um, Twitter uh, channel. So, so be sure to follow at Pulse. I'm going to quickly type that here, T-Net. I hope I didn't mistype it. No, I did not. Good. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, Julie. And a, a shout out to Sarah and Isa for keeping everything uh, running smoothly and organizing this. It's been a, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll see each other probably over the summer when we have our summer conference. Thanks a lot. Be well. <laughs>